I think you need to be fluid and flexible. You need to reinvent yourself. Business of Architecture, episode 419. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for building an architecture practice that lets you do your best work more often. Business of Architecture is the leading business consultancy that arms architects with strategies to win better projects and help you structure your practice so you can focus on doing your best work instead of being bogged down with the complexity of running a business. Build the business you need to get the work and do the work that you want. Discover more by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart. Joining me today is Jim Smyros. He's the founding partner of Smyros and Smyros Architects, and we're very, very glad to have him on the show with us today. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, Please follow the link in the information. Jim, welcome to the Business of Architecture podcast. Thank you. It's great to be here. Now, if you could tell us quickly about about your firm, what kind of work the firm does so we can get a context uh, for people that may not have heard of your firm before. So we're largely focused on high-end residential. Um, We have our our main studio is in Glen Cove uh, on the north shore of Long Island in an area known as the Gold Coast. uh, We have a satellite office in Manhattan. Um, And our work really uh, ranges from Manhattan uh, apartments out to uh, through the Gold Coast, large residences out to the Hamptons. And then we do some work in Miami, Palm Beach, and we've done some projects overseas as well in uh, England and in Moscow. Why is it called the Gold Coast for people that aren't familiar with the geography? So um, we are just about 30 miles outside of Manhattan. And what happened was... um, at the, in the late 1800s, wealthy people from Manhattan started to build large summer homes uh, along the North Shore of Long Island. They could get back and forth to Manhattan in a reasonable amount of time, and uh, they would build lavish estates. So the concept of the Great Gatsby really comes from uh, Great Neck and Sands Point, which are two necks that stick out north of Long Island, and we're in the next neck just beyond that, uh, which is Glen Cove. Um, So, you know, there's a rich history of many, many large uh, grand estates, which, you know, many of which still exist here. And anyone who visits your website, and we'll give that link at the end of the show, can see some of the amazing commissions that you've had the opportunity to do, as you mentioned, not only in the United States, but also internationally. Take us back. How long has the firm been around and, and what was the genesis of it? How did it start? So uh, I founded the firm 25 years ago, and I had been working before that uh, at a large international firm, which was starting to have some issues, and uh, I saw the writing on the wall. So I, I, was, I left there and started my own firm. And um, I, I started with really one client, and it was a large um, video game developer, and we did a corporate headquarters for them. So, you know, I started my own firm. Start, we were working on the second floor of our home with uh, my then, my, my current, my former wife, who was my partner at the time. And uh, we started working on this very large uh, corporate headquarters for a video game developer. Now, was that something that you had already lined up when you left? I'm always interested in the, the transition from going as an employee. It's, it's a leap to jump out into your own and to, suddenly have to, you know, pay the bills, invoice people. Did you already have that client lined up? Walk us through how that happened. Well, actually, no, I didn't. Um, You know, the the firm that I was with was having problems and was slowly um, closing. And I decided to leave and and start my own firm before that happened. And uh, we started to look for work. And what happened was one of the clients that I had worked with there actually sought me out. And uh, we had a good relationship when I worked there. And he uh, came to me and asked me if we would uh, consult with him on this project and uh, take a look at it. And as we started to work together, he realized that we were the right architects for it and gave us the entire commission. Wow. Now, the firm that you were working at before, are they still around or did they go out of business? 
No, they closed. It was a great firm, actually, and uh, they they did end up ceasing operations, sadly, after after a long time. But it was an international firm, and uh, I really learned a lot there. It was a, a phenomenal, phenomenal experience that really helped set a great base for my career. Any insights for why they ended up closing up shop? Well, um, I think that it was a big firm. It was uh, they did a lot of college work, a lot of work overseas, a lot of work in the Middle East, and um, it was a very large operation. I think it was two hundred and fifty people when I first got there, um, and then you know I left twelve years. I worked there for five years during school, seven years full time afterwards. And when I left after the twelfth year, it was uh, you know down to maybe twenty five people or so. And I mm. think that uh, you know the um, market had changed. There were some. There was a slowdown in real estate, and large projects uh, were becoming more and more competitive and harder to uh, come by. And the firm just lost its uh, larger base of uh, projects. Wow. So it sounds like, from your perspective, they weren't bringing in enough work. The firm ultimately starved and had to, and just firm owners decided to shut the doors. Correct. I think it was that also the, uh, you know, maybe the general partner was looking, you know, was busy with uh, other, other ventures as well. Yeah, that makes sense. So here you are, you have the great fortune where a client seeks you out. They want you to do uh, consult on the office building or the office build out that they're doing. And you're, you said you're the, you're in the second floor home office and uh, your former wife is your partner. Yes. So we start uh, this project and we're looking at spaces for them. And we found a great uh, building that was, uh, the shell was put up, um, but it was never finished. The developer went bankrupt and just sort of left it there. So our clients uh, looked at it. It was about 60,000 square feet. And um, they were prior to that in about five different locations in, in a little town, uh, Oyster Bay, where I actually live, um, in several of the buildings that I had done previously for that other firm. and. Um, we found that space, it was really ideal for them. We, we added some space to it and turned the whole thing into their executive headquarters. They were uh, a big video game developer and they were um, really at the early stages of that market. And it was exciting for us. We ended up with, uh, I'll be honest, we had about 15 people at one point working out of the second floor of my home. It was, uh, it was very busy. I would have loved to seen how the parking went. You know, it's funny that you say that, but fortunately, we lived uh, on a wooded lot and nobody, uh, none of the neighbors could really see that. Um, but we actually <laughs> had to park at the library in town and carpool people in because we only had so many spots on the uh, site. Amazing, getting it fun. done. Well, yeah. how, how much commercial work do you do now? Because looking at your website, it looks like most of it, I can't say I saw any commercial, it looked like it was mostly residential. Is that the case or did I just not look carefully enough? It's mostly residential. Um, and... What happened was we started with that one very large commercial project. I enjoyed it, but the truth is that that market was very competitive on Long Island. There's a lot of people in it, and I found like it was a race to the bottom. You know, this worked because that client pursued us, and we were able to get a good you know fee structure for it. But when we went back out to pursue other commercial projects, the fee rates were so competitive it just it was hard for us to be successful. So we've done commercial, we do some boutique design, but only when we're asked to and on the fee structure that works for us, um, which is more than what you find in the regular marketplace here. So the, predominantly the work on our site is high in residential. We've done some really great restaurant work recently, but it's for a special client. Well, and here on the podcast, I mean, I hate to disappoint our listeners, but the longtime listeners know that we don't get into too much of the design aspect. Um, you know, every architect on here has some quality of design that they do, and they're, they're experts in that field. We touch more on, of course, the business side of things, the things that they don't teach us in school, the practice side. Now, running a firm for 25 years, successfully being still in business, having 15 staff members, um, doing these large commissions, no small feat. No small feat. So, uh, Jim, what I'd like to know is along the years, what would you say are some of the key lessons? that you've learned about the business side of, of running the practice? Well, I, I will tell you that we uh, had some interesting lessons and times where it came fairly close. And uh, I would make the joke that we could hear the falls as we approached. And uh, the, first, the first time that happened was with that same video game client. We were doing work all over the, all over the country. And um, mm. 
what happened was they had a very successful game and it was Mortal Kombat that was Acclaim Entertainment and the game was tremendous and it was so big that it attracted uh, Microsoft and Sony into the industry and ultimately, you know, when those guys jumped in the pond, the ripple effect toppled our client and so we went from having all this work to no work almost overnight. And uh, mm. that was a crisis, and we survived and got through it. And we did that by shifting our focus to residential very quickly and looking at the market that we were in and something that we did well. Uh, we had done some residential for some of the key personnel at that firm, and we took that work, and we actually um, used, we made a postcard that we mailed to about 10,000 people. And uh, that first postcard actually got us a $10 million-plus commission on a residence. And uh, so we were very, we never had to really um, make any staff adjustments and we just were able to, uh, you know, go work on that, new, on that new project, which was uh, amazing. I mean, I'm sure it's been a while, but that must have just felt good to land that project at a time when maybe the, the scarcity setting in the, you know, where's the next project going to come from? Uh, what, what a big win for the firm. It was, and it was. Uh, I was really happy to do it, and it was. We were fortunate because with that project, that attracted other projects, and uh, so you know, it was scary. You know, having all your eggs in one basket. You know, you, we were doing well. I mean, that 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 company paid. They were even tenants of ours, and we had bought a great studio space in Glen Cove. It was a old post office building built in 1905, and we renovated it, and we occupied the third floor and let them rent the first two, and then that that even went south. So. Uh, we had to shift gears quickly, but we did. And, um, you know, it, it was challenging. I had to put a lot of my own personal assets back into the business to shore mm -hmm. it up while collections adjusted. And, you know, but we, uh, we recovered from it. We had a, a few times like that over the history of the firm that have been tests of, you know, sort of uh, your metal. But, uh, you know, we, and the most recent, of course, being the pandemic, you know, here has been uh, part of that. Yeah. You know, it's, that's something we don't talk about a lot, but, but owners, you know, putting, shoring up the business, like you said, putting personal assets back into the business, something that at times is required as a business owner, because let's face it, if the cash flow isn't flowing properly to pay people, keep people on staff and be able to run the business, a lot of times we have to dip into our own pocket. Now, was your wife still a partner at that time? Did that make it easier where she was on board with putting personal assets back in or? Yes, she was at that, at that point. And, uh, yeah. It, and it's something that we had to do, um, and it wasn't. We never even gave it a second thought. You know, it just mm -hmm. uh, the business was important, and uh, we put money back in to shore it up, and then you know that that came back out again, and we were rewarded for it ultimately. And that wasn't. You know, there was other times later where we had issues with sometimes with collections. So another lesson learned was don't let your collections get too big. Um, mm -hmm. You know, generally our collections are really manageable, and they don't run more than thirty days. We had one client we were doing $100 million worth of work for, residential work, one very large project in New York and another one in Florida. And um, collections, you know, the receivable became very high. And, you know, we should have um, questioned it sooner, but we kept working. And it got mm -hmm. to the point where that receivable was a major number for us. And then uh, somebody decided that it was time to renegotiate our deal. And uh, that, that was almost uh, a crisis that we uh, – was that was a – real challenging one, but we weathered that and got through it and uh, continued. We finished those projects, um, but, you know, that was a real test. Yeah. Now, in, in your firm, in your firm, do you have middle management in the firm or does everyone report directly to you? I'd like to understand sort of how your structure is set up. We do have middle management. So uh, there's myself and I have a partner um, who uh, works with me. I largely do all of the... Um, marketing and the client contact and a, a big portion of the design work he does a lot of the uh technical pieces he's in charge of really the studio um and making sure the work gets done and then in the studio itself we have project architects intermediates and junior architects and we try to make teams where there's a you know a project architect an intermediate and a junior ideally um and you know as projects move around those can we borrow from one team to another you know sometimes it may be one person on a project and then when you're ready to finalize it you know publish a set of cds you might have five or six people on it i'm curious what what generally what do the intermediate architects do what are they responsible for well so 
what I like to do with our intermediate architects is I really look at them as project architects in training. They're really supporting the project architect lead. And, um, you know, if the project architect is busy on another project, they can pretty much fulfill most of their duties. Um, and so when we did a very large project, for instance, we did a horse farm in Wellington and we would fly down there, you know, two times a week, the project architect would go and then his intermediate would go um, and they'd alternate. Uh, so that, that our goal is to really bring people up that way and, you know, promote from within. And I mean, it sounds like a great structure for redundancy. Well, I, I think that's important. Um, I like that overlap and I like, I also, it was important to us. At one point we had the firm sort of organized as uh, a design department and a construction documents department and people that did mm -hmm. observation, but people didn't really enjoy it as much. It didn't feel as fulfilling. So what we really like to do is let everybody participate. So when we're doing design, that same team is involved in the design aspect of it. Uh, we'll work as a team on that. The, um, construction documents and then the observation. So, you know, the intermediate and the junior architect will get to go out to the field occasionally as well. So they get a full architectural experience and education. Mm, wonderful. So in, in addition, other than the, the postcard that you sent out, which 10,000 postcards, that's, that's no small amount of postcards. But other than that, what other, let's say active, any other active marketing that you've done that, that has, has been effective for you? Yeah, uh, we, we do a few things. We work, um, we do advertise, um, and we advertise in design magazines, you know, shelter magazines. Um, and uh, we do that fairly consistent, consistently, and I find that I will meet people, you know, who have been saving those images for years. I'm almost amazed. Um, wow. So, you know, I find that, that I don't get too often a call that says we saw your ad in, in this magazine or that magazine as much as it builds brand uh, recognition and people are aware of us. Um, so we do that. We do email blasts. We work with, you know, industry partners to promote the business as well. Um, we when will, you say industry partners, help me understand how does that work? Well, largely, you know, we'll, we'll talk to either realtors or contractors. Um, you know, in the residential market, you're either, you know, you're buying a home, you're selling a home, you're buying land, um, mm. or you're building one. And uh, so we've actually gotten work referred to us by realtors and by contractors. You know, we once gave a contractor a project in Palm Beach, um, and we really, you know, held his feet to the fire. Uh, and he appreciated that ultimately he got a very large project, got in trouble and needed somebody to help him. So he brought us in to do do that work. Um, so, you know, we would get referrals from architects, I mean, from uh, contractors and realtors all the time. And uh, that's been a, a nice piece of the business as well. Makes sense. Anything yeah. else? Well, today we've turned to Instagram, you know, uh, mm -hmm. we uh, use that quite a bit for the business. That's been, there's been a big shift and uh, we have a lot of inquiries that come through that. Um, and uh, that's, interesting it's an interesting tool that we're adapting to and i think using well and uh, that's been been good for us yeah now the inquiries you get through through instagram i'm curious because being in the part of the world where you're at let's face it probably some of the highest net worth individuals live in and around the area we know you know the hamptons are legendary uh you know you mentioned the great gatsby um with with instagram of course it has a worldwide reach any problems there with looky lose or people who, you know, let's face it, they, they can't really afford your services bombarding you guys with emails or things like that. Or are you getting qualified, real, like legitimate projects and leads from that? I would say that for the most part, it's pretty qualified. People, you know, mm. know what the work is. I, I, we do get inquiries, you know, for things like, you know, where's that uh, finish? What is that finish? What's that color? And we answer all those things. Um, but it's That's not, nice. It's, not, it's, probably other, it's probably other architects, right? Thinking, oh, I'd like, I'd like maybe I'll do that on my project. Yeah, and we we and I'm sure that happens. People are like I love that stone. Where does it come from? And we share. You know, sometimes I, I will tell you. Twenty years ago, we did a house, and we saw something that maybe it was fifteen years ago. We saw something that Stern used that we liked, and we called his office, and they told us what the stone was and what what quarry it came from. So I learned that lesson. You know, early on, we can share, and uh, we do. And so we we do that on Instagram, and but we do get qualified uh, inquiries from it. Absolutely. Beautiful. And so that, that first house that was the, 
I believe you said it was a $10 million project budget. From there, did, it, did the referrals just start to come in? How did the firm grow to be what it is today? Well, yeah, that's, that's exactly what happened. We started to build that project. It was on a large piece of land on the water. It had a lot of notoriety. Um, might have even been more than $10 million. And uh, it was a significant home that was very uh, well received in the community. And we ultimately did you know, postcards with that house on it. And um, it was interesting because as the projects got larger, we realized we had to dial back some of the marketing because we were getting to this echelon of the market where there was very, it was very rarefied. And, uh, you know, we didn't want to end up becoming so exclusive that nobody could work with us. So we had to sort of dial back some of the imagery and not show everything because it would just become people would say, well, do you want to work on my project? And, you know, we, we do projects in the studio. Typically, we start around a million dollars. We find that if we try to do anything for less than a million dollars, that we suffer and it costs us just as much as a million dollar project. So we need to be working uh, on a million dollar fee basis. And uh, the truth is that the million dollar projects require almost as much work as a five million dollar project. So if we had our druthers, we'd do all you know, larger projects, but it doesn't work that way. So we do plenty of two and three million dollar projects. And I like to keep that mix in the studio. If everything is big, you know, we can just be going for years. Um, and that can be challenging. Again, too much like all your eggs in one basket. Mm. I'd like to kind of going back to your formative years. I mean, we discussed your heritage. It was kind of cool, the conversation off camera before the, uh, before this interview came on. And um, I think you mentioned your grandparents were immigrants to America, and somehow I find that 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 there's sort of an ethos that runs in the family. I'm curious if you experienced that at all. Um, some sort of work ethic, some sort of cultural value, something that has really you feel has been distinctive for you uh, to to help you be more successful. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so I was always one of the first in, last out, and uh, you know I always had a. Mm. a a very, very, uh, was, I was happy to work hard and I felt like if I didn't get it right the first time, I'd just come at it again and work harder. And, um, that was something I really credit my parents and grandparents for. They had a tremendous work ethic and weren't afraid to put the time in. And so that's, that's how I was raised. And it did, it definitely impacted our ability. You know, when there was times we would work, uh, you know, very late or around the clock to produce a project. <laughs> Not, 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 not unfamiliar, not, right. not, not unusual. Yeah. Now you've also been, you've had, maybe it's just how we say that the fortune or the, 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 uh, unfortunate or disfortunate of going through probably a number of recessions. I mean, let's face yes. it. And right now we're in the middle of this pandemic, which is absolutely crazy. But I, I'm curious in your location, how cyclical is it? Uh, being in that area where there is so much wealth. Have you seen a lot of fluctuation that correspond to the recessions? Not so much? Well, it's interesting because um, generally it's a pretty recession-proof market at a certain level. Um, the the entry-level stuff does, does suffer. Um, the time that we probably had the biggest challenge was 2008. Um, mm. We actually, our clients were all okay. Um, but we had projects that people terminated out of what we called luxury shame. And they were embarrassed to be spending money. And I, I realized when that became an issue that it was going to be problematic. There was no talking people out of it. They didn't have mortgages and they didn't have issues paying for the work. They just were embarrassed to be building something, you know, that might be perceived as grand while their friends were out of work. So that yeah. that was a tough one for us. And that was a tough time. But we were actually uh, fortunate enough that we had some very large scale projects that spanned that for us. So we were doing an $80 million sports complex in someone's private estate that you know, ran for uh, almost 10 years and that, kept, that, that fed the baby for a while. Wow, wow, yeah. incredible, yeah. incredible. Well, what, 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 what advice or, or kind of perspective would you give to people who are coming up in the profession right now, they may be worried about the economy. They may be worried about how the industry is changing. What advice would you give to them? Well, I think you need to be fluid and flexible. You need to reinvent yourself. And I, I don't think you can hold on to, this is how we did it last week. And that's just how we do it. You have to continually evolve. I think that's very important for a firm to stay fluid and um, to 
look at what's happening in your marketplace and decide where you want to be. I think that, you know, just as we, as architects, we decide where we want to be design wise, you can make that same decision as a firm where you want to be business wise. So there are times that we walk away from projects that just don't fit our business model or we don't think we can be successful on. We don't take everything, even though, you know, we may want to do it. It just may not be the right fit. Um, and we want to do it because it's business, but you know, we might just decide it's not the right thing for us. So I think you need to stay, you need to stay true to that as you do to your design. And I think that if you do that, you can ultimately, you can find what it is that you want to do and do it well. Your website is predominantly classical, maybe all very particular style. Why, why classical? Have you found it a benefit to, to stay within that realm? Um, how has that impacted the business? And let's face it, classical buildings are very, very difficult to pull off, or traditional, traditional classical, very difficult to pull off correctly. And I mean, you guys do a brilliant job at it. Can you speak to us about that at all? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, the firm I worked at before was really a modernist firm. And we didn't, I, when I was in school, you know, we were going through the postmodern period. Um, and what happened was, I think as the millennium approached, people became very, um, they, they wanted to hold on to more classical things and classical design was always very popular, but, but particularly in the high end market, because it, you know, those icons have been there for 2000 years and um, people wanted to latch onto those and it made them feel good about home. So um, classical architecture, works in that language now of course over time that's evolved and we do a lot more transitional um, interiors uh, that are much more open um, and you know the architecture outside is sort of a modern version of classical um, it's it's lighter and uh, you know the homes from the street present on approach is a home that might have been there since the 20s uh, but then when you get inside they're clearly you know new homes and often they're waterfront homes and on the water side the apertures of all the windows are opened and uh, you know it presents very differently but that's part of that is is you knowing your client base what they're looking for they all want it to look a certain way from the street they want to present an image and uh, then they want to live a certain way inside so and we've done some more modern things you know we did uh, our projects in uh, london in england where we converted uh, two existing estates outside of london in wentworth uh, we did very modern interiors there and then um in uh we just did a big penthouse in miami in south beach also in a, in a brand new building and that was uh very you know concrete walls marble slabs and uh mm. very uh very clean so i enjoy mm. working in a range of styles actually and uh when a client wants to come and do something different i embrace it you know we we immediately build a, a reference library for that and start working with it got it got it so, I mean, after having run the practice for this long and, you know, seeing, I mean, what, what an amazing number of products that you've been able to work on and experience. I'm just curious where, where to next, where do you see this headed? Where would you like to, what's the next chapter? Well, you know, really the next chapter is just the next project. I, I, I enjoy the firm at the size it's at. Um, I, I find that if you get over, uh, you really the, the ideal ratio is 10 to 1, 10 staff to one partner. If you get more than that, it just becomes a business and it's very hard to feel like a design architect. Um, so I sort of, I'm comfortable with the size of the firm as it is right now. I feel like I can do what I love. Um, ultimately, you know, I, I could see us opening up a satellite office potentially and it's interesting because every time i get to the point where i think i want to do that something happens in the economy i'm a little slow mm -hmm. and conservative so i never quite get to that until uh you know either the economy finally tanks or you know the pandemic comes and then you sort of think well maybe now's not the time to do it so uh, i've had that thought on a few times but um you know it, not having offices in florida and not having an office out in the hamptons hasn't really stopped us from working in in those areas so I, I think you know the what I look forward to is just developing more projects that uh, we like working on, and you know hopefully the you know we get to do some great renovations and some great new builds. Yeah, 
I, I'm curious about, about your sales process or the process of onboarding a new client, engagement with a new client. Is it, can you walk me through the steps just briefly? I'm curious, do you, is it a thing where they kind of understand the scope of your fees that you'll be charging them? You send them a proposal. Do you like to agree on the proposal in person? How do you run that? Because let's face it, these people are very wealthy. They probably have their pick of people they'd want to work with. Do they come to you knowing that they want to use you or are a lot of times you're in a competitive situation? I would say more than half the times they know they want to use us and mm -hmm. um, they're, they're not negotiating with us. You know, we sort of, we'll have a telephone interview. We'll tell them how we work. Uh, I'll typically end the call with talking about what our fee structure is. I'll send them an email kind of recapping everything and outlining the fee structure there. And, uh, you know, we will have our, an initial meeting. And, and talk about the project. Once we sort of understand better what it is, we'll we'll send them a proposal. But they're you know it's pretty consistently it's a percentage fee, um, and we do get people who come in that want to try and um, negotiate something different than that. And I just explain that you know we have tried every possible combination over the years. They don't work for us. We know this works. It's tried and true. And if you want to work with us, that's that's just the way we work. And I I will tell you that we've seen the back slip some heads as they walk out the door um, but it's okay because um, that's just a race to the bottom and I don't want to negotiate like that and I, I just find that I can't I can't do the level of work that we love and the level of detail that we need to do for half the fee um, we just can't do it and uh, mm. so at that point you know I'd rather have less work and of course we've been fortunate that we haven't really that hasn't really happened but you know would always be yeah. prepared for that so do you do any of the initial phases, maybe the schematic design or anything like that on an hourly basis, or do you just go for the lump sum fee of what you know that it's going to take to deliver a project like that and it works out for you? We'll do both. Um, we will often, we will, some clients will sign a contract and just get started, but we always give them an out and we convert the whole, we convert our fees to hourly uh, on the out. So if they decide gotcha. at some point they're not happy or, you know, if it's a project where they're just not sure, we'll start in schematics and work hourly and apply those to a fee as well. We'll do it either it. way. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes Part sense of the challenge with that, that latter version, you know, where you're working on schematics is like you feel like you're doing your best work and you're, you're producing, you're giving them your brilliance, you know, on an hourly mm. basis. It's very hard yeah. to really find an appropriate hourly fee for that. Yeah. Um, so I, I try not to do that, honestly. That makes sense. That makes sense. Beautiful point. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's your juice. It's where all the value is created. It's where the, the creative yeah. genius happens. Yeah. And when you look at an hourly rate, I mean, you know, honestly, that, that work that happens in the beginning of a project, you know, that spark that creates the project um, is so much a percentage of the overall fee in a sense. Sure. We've got to, you know, we've got to select all the finishes and we've got to work everything out, but after, that all comes after sort of figuring out what the project is going to be. I enjoy that initial part, but really all the history of, the, of your work, everything you've done, all the time everybody in your office has spent, all the travel you've done, all affect that first perspective on the project. And mm. if you're not really properly rewarded for that and you're giving your work away on an hourly basis consistently there, I think that it's just giving up your genius sort of for a, a low number. Makes sense. Well, Jim, thank you for joining us here on the Business of Architecture podcast today. It was a pleasure. Happy to talk about this and, you know, always uh, enjoy the opportunity to speak about the Business of Architecture. So thank you for having me. You're welcome. Great. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to 
smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.